Good morning, Boker Tov, and welcome back to Parsha Perspectives for today. Great to resume, great to be together. I hope everybody had a wonderful Pesach and a Guten Zummer, as they say. Parsha Shir is, series is sponsored generously by Becky and Avi Katz and family in memory of Becky's father, David Grossman. Our learning is Leila Nishmas, David Ben Menachem Manish. The Shir this morning is also sponsored by our dear friend Myrna Hershorn on the occasion of the second year site of Marvin Hershorn, Moshe Natan Ben Menachem Mendel. We miss Marvin. It's a wonderful, wonderful member of our community. By Elisa Waxman, or Fuwa Shlema, for Miriam Bas Tzviya and Basia Bas Chavia, Chava, Shereva Fuwa Shlema, as well as Esther Tila Bas Ariel Tzipora. We have the privilege this morning of learning Parshas Achare Mos, page 636 in the Art Scroll, Stone Chumash. Achare Mos, which by now you should have heard the opening of Achare Mos. I think we read it like four or six times because of the way that Yanta fell out this year, at least here in America, in the diaspora, in the Gullus. Uh, we read it so many times, so you are familiar with the opening of it. God spoke to Moshe. When was this communication? When was this conversation? After the death of the two sons of Aaron, their tragic, premature, inexplicable death. Because all they were trying to do was draw close to Hashem. They offered a sacrifice that wasn't asked or commanded of them. In fact, so enigmatic, so ambiguous is the text itself that we know that it's unclear what exactly happened, what went wrong, why were they hold so accountable, why did they lose their lives. All we know is they crossed some boundary or line, because when they tried to draw close to Hashem, they did it in some inappropriate way, so much so that, so much so that it was a capital punishment, a capital crime, they literally lost their lives in this spiritual quest. And we know now in the shadow of that death, we have the introduction of the Yom Kippur service. Moshe is instructed to speak to his brother Aaron and to tell him, you cannot be casual in your relationship or attitude towards holiness. You cannot come in whenever you want. You can't simply enter. You can't enter out of habit or rote. Only with this can you enter. And so on. We've studied the opening of this parasha before. You can find it online. What was the concern? Beautiful insight of Rav Chaim Shmulevitz. We've analyzed previously that familiarity breeds contempt. Familiarity breeds contempt. You become too casual, too comfortable, too familiar. Then you lose that sense of holiness. You lose the spontaneity, you lose the energy, you lose the romance, you lose the love, you lose the passion, you lose the mindfulness and the connection. Any behavior or activity that becomes a pattern or rote with which we are too familiar, it breeds contempt. Familiarity breeds contempt. And the Torah says to Aaron, the holiest place you cannot be too familiar with. You have to pace yourself and you have to protect and preserve the sense of excitement within yourself. And what's true here in the beginning of our parsha is true and is a great lesson for life about spontaneity and electricity and energy and excitement and having boundaries and being able to be disciplined in order to protect and preserve that sense of an excitement. Why is all of this being given now? Why is all this being given here? And the answer is that this is the reaction or response, at least the Torah, to this premature death of the sons of, of Aram. The Medrash says, now, we're invoking the death of the sons of Aaron. We know, again, I told you, there are countless explanations that are offered within Chazal themselves and within the commentaries that have followed since then. What did the sons of Aaron do wrong? Where exactly did they go wrong? What did they do wrong? And why were they struck down in the prime of their life and what should have been Aaron's happiest day? Where did they go wrong? So Medrash Rabbah says, one of them is, They answered a halachic response. They adjudicated a law in front of Moshe, their teacher. And we know the Gemara Nehru and Samach Gimel tells us, Mikan, we learned something here, If you're in front of your Rebbe and a question is posed, and you should defer, you should submit, you should with modesty, be quiet and allow the Rebbe, your own teacher or the greater authority to answer. But instead, you arrogantly insert yourself. 
you respond without any sense of context or acknowledgement, you're chay of Misa. You're chay of Misa. And asks of Yerucham Levavitz, the great mashkiach of the Mir. Tzorach lo'avon lefi divrei chazal shezai yachet, ma'ap shat bedivrei akasa bekar v'asam lefnei Hashem v'ayamusu. If where they went wrong was that they answered a question in front of Moshe, if that was their mistake, which proved to be a fatal flaw, then why did the Torah describe it as Bikar Vasam Lafne Hashem? Torah says, Achare Moshne Bene Aaron, after the two sons of Aaron die, and what precipitated their death? What was the cause of death on their death certificate? Bikar Vasam Lafne Hashem. They tried to go close to Hashem. Then why does the Medrash fill in? No, the cause of death was they answered a question in front of Moshe. They should have been silent, humble, modest, and deferred to Moshe. But they inserted themselves. They thought that they were an authority, even though, of course, they were much younger and much less in stature. So why why then write? The reason was the Karvasam. So said Rav Yerucham, it's in his Das Torah, in the Sefer Das Torah, the collected teachings of Rav Yerucham on Chumash. It says, Ad Rabba. A person needs to know in life, stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. I love that expression. But stay in your lane. Know who you are and be makir es makomo. Know your place. Know your place. This is an enormous challenge in our time and in our generation. Here's a Parsha perspective for today at the risk of sounding like an old you know, in our day. But it's a big challenge in our time. Young people, but it's seeped in not only to young people, who don't know how to stay in their place, who don't know how to stay in their lane, who think entitled to opinions when they have no knowledge, no life experience, no authority, and when they are in the presence of people who have so much more of all of that. And don't know their place, and don't know how to stay in their lane. When you're meant to be heard from. You know, when I was growing up, my parents would always say, you know, not that children are meant to be seen but not heard, or whatever the expression is, but if you happen to be around and adults are having a conversation, if you don't insert yourself or make your presence known, you'll get away with the fact that you're eavesdropping, that you're there. But the moment you feel to weigh in, the moment that you make your presence known by sharing your opinion or your thought, now you've alerted everyone to your presence and you're likely going to be excluded from the conversation. You have to know your place. You have to know when your opinion is welcome and invited and wanted, when you're entitled to an opinion, and when not. But we're living in a time, a dangerous time, in which all opinions are equal, in which everyone's equal. So the 90-year-old with 90 years of life experience, 90 years of learning under their belt, and 90 years of learning in the school of hard knocks, and then you have the the uh, 14-year-old who says, my opinion is just as valid, it's just as legitimate, it's just as meaningful, and I'm just as entitled to it. And who says you're right just because you're older? Now, of course, we recognize and respect the dignity of every person and their right to a thought and to an opinion. But we have to understand how to be makiras makomo. A person has to know how to recognize their place in life. And the principle, the importance of being quiet. We spoke about this recently. At Revolba taught, we always reward the child when they begin to speak. We copy, yay, they said a word, they said a sentence. We get so excited when they learn to speak. But we forget to teach them the importance of how to be quiet. We don't reward them or clap. We don't have that same enthusiasm when it's time to be quiet. And you learn much more when you're quiet than when you speak. And a person needs to know when to speak and when to be and when to be quiet. The Piazetz Nerebbe, Hashem Yikom Damo, Zechet Tzadik, Levracha, Kalanam is Kalman Shapiro of Piazetna, who was murdered by the Nazis in his introduction to Chovas HaTamidim, bemoans this thought. I always say when I share this, that when he wrote Chovas HaTamidim in its introduction, he lived in a small town outside Warsaw, Piazetna, then he was in the Warsaw Ghetto, he's the Rav of Warsaw, but he led an educational system of Hasidus. And when he, long before he knew the Holocaust was coming, the biggest danger he thought that loomed and threatened was the premature arrogance of young people. He's writing about this in the early 1900s, the 1920s, early 1930s. And he's writing that young people in our time think that they are entitled to opinions. They think they're more sophisticated. They think they have more knowledge than they really do. So how do you, if you just tell them, you're an immature, unsophisticated child, be quiet, you're not entitled to an opinion, that won't work. That won't engage them, that won't convince them, that won't persuade them. So his beautiful introduction to Chavos is, how do you engage a generation that think that way? 
It's a brilliant, brilliant introduction. I highly recommend reading it. He was writing it already then, and all the more so now. You see it seeped in. I'm just getting this on my chest, and then we'll go on. But you see it seeped in even to the vernacular of a younger generation. They use an expression we never would have used when we were young, which is guys. Guys, are you ready to go? What do you want, guys? Guys, did you, guys is like, we're talking to the president of the United States. Again, apolitical, whatever you think of last, this president, next president. But it they, they, doesn't matter who they're talking to. They say, guys, guys, two Holocaust survivors will speak at our Yom HaShoah program tomorrow night. You guys ready to go? You guys, you guys did an amazing job tonight in the Holocaust. You guys? You guys? You hear that all the time from young people today. Nobody's correct them. Nobody's taught them. that You don't refer to everybody. Two gedolei ador can be sitting there. You guys are amazing. And they mean it. You're amazing. But you're not you guys. You guys. So anyway, Rav Yerucham says that a person needs to be makiris makomo. You have to know with, with, within whose mechitza you are, in whose presence you sit, when you should speak and when you should be silent. Thank you for listening, by the way. I feel so much better. When you're in the presence of greatness, of greater people, of your teacher, then even when you think you're entitled to an opinion, and even when taka, you are entitled, even when you studied it, when you're brilliant, when you're well-versed in it, but a person should condition themselves that when in the presence of someone greater, a greater authority, someone deserving of greater respect, it's as if I don't exist. I'm not an entity. I'm a non-entity. I don't exist. And I'm not waiting to express or exert who I am. I'm a kibble. I'm receiving from others. And that's what it means. This is the, the connection between the two, says Rav Yerucham. How do you stim? How do you say... The Torah testifies what was the violation by Karma Sam they tried to draw close to God. Chazal come along and say, What does that mean? They were Moda Halacha Bafne Rabbam. They answered, even the Moshe was there. It means Bakar, you're trying to get too close to God. Do you know in whose machitza you sit? What are you and God? Is God now one of the guys also? Good job, guys. Good job, guy. God is also now one of the guys. You have to know when to recoil with humility, with modesty. You have to know your place in comparison and in contrast. So it is a parallel to not know that vis-a-vis -vis Hashem and to not know that vis-a-vis -vis others. And that's therefore what the answer is. What does the Torah then continue with here in our parsha? What's the next azhara? What's the next warning from Hashem? Al yavo kodesh. You can't approach whenever you want. This isn't a casual relationship. You don't walk in without knocking. You don't come without being invited. You don't access whenever you want. And you don't speak casually to God that he's one of the guys. There isn't a sense of casual, random, rote familiar, familiarity. There has to be a sense of dignity and awe. And awe. A lost art today. Awe. That which we get goosebumps over. Not that which we feel awe of. Ayavobacholes. The antidote and the response to the behavior of the Shnei Bnei Aaron is Ayavo B'cholais. They might have had noble intent. They wanted to draw close. It was noble intent. But even with the most noble intent, you have to know where there are boundaries and where there are lines and where there are machitzas and stay and operate within them, not run right through them. Rab Nachman. Rab Nachman has a great teaching on this opening of our parsha too. Says the Heliger of Nachman, this beautiful sefer we've been going through, Shulchan HaShabbos. It's not Rav Nachman on the Parsha, but it's teachings of Rav Nachman adapted to the Parsha. Very beautiful. Another one of the opinions of why the two sons of Aaron were cut down in the prime of their life is they were offering unsolicited sacrifices, namely the incense. A fire came out. And the fire consumed them. And there are countless commentaries on what did they do wrong and what caused them to do it. Where did they go wrong? Noble, good boys, raised well, incredible role model, father, mother, uncle, family, aunt. Where did they go wrong? And what led them to go wrong? 
So one opinion is they were drunk. They came in intoxicated. The Mishkan was a dry place. You weren't allowed to have alcohol in the Mishkan. How do we know that that might be the reason? Because right after the two of them die, not in our parsha, but the parsha when they die in Shmini, what is the next instruction? Yayim v'sheichar al teisht. You're not allowed to drink alcohol in the Mishkan. Why would you insert that right there if it had no relevance? The answer is, where did they go wrong? They were inebriated, they were intoxicated. Some people think when you drink too much, oh, that's ruchnius, that's spirituality. When you lose yourself and you get drunk, now you've found Hashem. Torah tells us the exact opposite. That is a counterfeit high. The greatest, most authentic, most real high you can get is to get high on God. So when you're in God's presence and you have the ability to get high on Him, to instead get high on a substance is the ultimate slap in his face. So it's a capital crime. It's a capital punishment if you drink in the Mishkan, in the Mikdash. What about outside the Mishkan and the Mikdash? When you're not Lifnei Hashem, when we don't have the privilege of getting high on God with the intense presence the way we do in the Mishkan. So maybe then, I shared with you before the inside of Salavechik, that's why Purim, Chai Venish Levesume, because Akati Avde Achashvero Shanon, when we don't have a mikdash and we don't have access to God in that way, maybe it can loosen us up a little bit to feel a connection when we're struggling to find it because we're still in the gullus. But in the mishkan, in the mikdash, don't substitute the authentic thing for the counterfeit thing. And therefore, according to some, that's what they were guilty of. Oh, another opinion is, Others say, you know what the problem was? They were waiting and eager in the wings. You know, when Moshe and Aaron croak, when they kick the bucket, we're going to step right in. We are in the on-deck circle. We are in the batter's but We're ready to go. All we're waiting is for them to vacate. Another opinion tells us, you know what their problem was? They never got married. Nadav and Aviyu never got No, it doesn't mean that they were you know, stuck in the Shidduch system. They tried, they dated incessantly, but it never broke through. It means they told all the Shadchanim, we're in the freezer for life. We are frozen section for good. We're not coming out. We're not thawing. We are not dating. We're not in the parsha. We're not interested. Why? Why were they not in the parsha? Why did they tell all the Shadchanim, move on? Take our name, face, and picture out of your file. Why? So I'll tell you, first of all, the Chassam Sofer has a mag- phenomenal interpretation. Chassam Sofer looks and he sees that they're cousins. Moshe's children. Can anyone here name Moshe's children? Were Moshe's children his successors? Did they take over? No. They look at their cousins and they say, you know, Uncle Moshe, this is a chsam sofer. Chsam sofer, chsam sofer. Uncle Moshe was so, de- so dedicated and devoted to serving Klal Yisrael, he never saw his kids. And they paid a price. So you know what? We can't do that and we won't do that to children. We're going to inherit the place of our own and we're going to have to be devoted to the service of the people. We're not going to bring kids into this world who we will be absentee parents to. Even this, they didn't get married because they didn't want children because they didn't want to neglect those children because they led lives of service to Klal Yisrael. And that was the wrong thinking. They were held accountable for it. That's what they say. But that's not what he says here. Here he says, you know what the problem was? They were arrogant. They said, you know why we're not getting married? There's no woman out there for us. There's nobody good enough. Have you read my profile, my resume? Have you called my references? Have you seen my picture? There's nobody out there for me. Don't bother writing a shidduch. Don't bother trying. Because there is no one. Rav Nassim writes in Likutei Alachos, the great student of Rav Nachman. What's the kesher? What's the connection between the fact that they refused to marry, they remained outside the shidduch system, they stayed in the freezer, and the fact that they offered this unsolicited sacrifice of the ketoros, of the incense. In Yonam Shalan Nesuan Uchibur, listen to this teaching, beautiful teaching. Reb Nassim quotes his master, his teacher, of Nachman. What is the essence of marriage? Connection. Bond. Chibur. Kishur ben ish isha to integrate and to blend and v'hayu l'basarecha, to become one. Bena olama sa'oyonu l'tachtonim, to bridge heaven and earth, to bridge and to transcend differences. 
גם עניין של אקטורס הוא חיבור. אינסנס is also all about unifying and unity and connection. How is that so? השורש קוף תס רש בארמיס פירושו קשירה. קוף תס רש קטורס קטר is really קשירה is to tie together, to tie the knot, to be connected. ולכן הקטורס בעצם נקרא יזכח משום שהיא מקשר את הכל הקדוש ברוך הוא. It ties everything and everyone. It binds and bonds us to the Ribbon of Shalom. Kochu lechaber l'Hashem gamas hachalakim anemuchim biyoser b'metzias. Now here's the thing what the Ketoros is supposed to do. What's one of the ingredients of the Ketoros? The Chelbena. The Ketoros has very pleasant fragrances and aromas. It has this, the Kiviyachol, the cinnamon, and the par- persimmon, what's it called? I don't even know. I, I just cinnamon. That's all I got. That's it. It's got these pleasant smelling things, but it also has one other ingredient called chelbena. Chelbena is putrid. It's disgusting. It's malodorous. And it has to be part of the ketoras. It has to be part of the ketoras. Lachin machila ketoras benos l'vasam ha-sheba gam es ha-chelbena sh'reich ha-ra. וגם היא מצטרפת אצלו להשם הגה בין זבח בתוך הקטורס. ודור של חז"ל וגמור אינקריסוס דאבוב תיצ'ס, כל תנא שאין בה מפושי ישראל אין התנאס. any Jewish fast day that in our prayers and among our congregation are not violators our Torah, if we don't make room and space and we don't warmly welcome those who are imperfect, those who are broken, those who fail, then we don't, we don't really have a tanas. The potion, those who can't find themselves and those who consistently make mistakes and those who've fallen far, they have a place. They're one of the ingredients in our mixture, in our recipe. Our recipe is incomplete. Our recipe is a flop and a fail if it doesn't have the putrid, malodorous spice because everyone has a place. And I'll tell you a little secret. I said this in a drusha a couple months ago. Are you sure that you're not the Chelbana? Before you so higher than thou, holier than thou, don't make room and don't allow someone else in the community. Are you positive that you're not the Chelbana? That other people are tolerating? We once had a very unusual circumstance. Before it was popular. Someone who underwent a transition in their gender. It's a very complicated Allah Shaila. Spoke to one of the greatest postkim of our generation. Their ability to continue to dive in our community and the sensitivity that demanded tried to educate the community someone came to speak to me and said can't have them can't be here disgust me it offends me I can't dive in the same shul this person forgot that just a couple years earlier they used to drive to shul on shabbos and while they took the extraordinary step of becoming a balash tshuva and they now keep shabbos to its fullest and they're inspiring it's beautiful did they read the torah's punishment for the person who's violated Shabbos in public before they so self-righteously and sanctimoniously came and said, I can't be in the same room as that Chelbana. Two years ago, they were the Chelbana other people were tolerating. How do we know when we're the Chelbana and we're being tolerated? And shouldn't we therefore be more tolerant of others who might be the Chelbana in that moment? Because the Gemara concludes that the Ketoros, which is a kesher, a connection, it's binding. If it's missing that ingredient, it's ineligible. It's inadequate. You can't put it on the Mizbech. And that's why, how do we begin Yom Kippur? The Torahs are out there on the Bima. The Heliga president of the congregation is standing up there next to the Chazan. And what does the Chazan say? We're wearing white. We're aspiring for holiness. The holiest moment of the year. And how does the Chazan begin? Let's daven with the Avaryanim. We haven't filtered out all the people we think don't meet our standards. Everybody's welcome. There's room for everyone. Sometimes we're allowing the Avaryanim. Sometimes we are the Avaryanim. Not all year is that easy. Not in every moment. Sometimes we have to distance ourselves. 
And sometimes we have to maintain an atmosphere, an environment that's aspirational to protect the environment. Not so simple. But a Kohen Gadol beyond my Kippur, a Shari Kodesh HaKadosh HaKadosh only the Kohen Gadol on Yom Kippur could enter the Kodesh HaKadosh and Lahak Tashom HaSakitoras. The high priest on the holiest day of the year, in the holiest place of the year, brings this incense when he's connected to all Klai Yisrael. But Adam Acher, someone else, Afilu Kohen Gadol, Bezman Acher, even the Kohen Gadol not on Yom Kippur is not allowed to. Let's say the Kohen Gadol in the middle of, of February says, you know, I feel moved by the unity of Klai Yisrael. By Mika Amcha Yisrael, I want to go in the Kodesh HaKadosh of Makta Dektoros with the Chalbana because I feel it today. Nope, only on Yom Kippur. Lachin Chayi V'Kohen Gadol Yos Nasui. So Kohen Gadol has to be married. Shekin Anasu M'Samon Kamur Eschibor Min Olam Asal Yonam because marriage is all about connection. And you know what marriage is also all about? Marriage is about not only tolerating but loving the imperfections in the other and loving that our imperfections are loved by the other. There is no perfect marriage of two perfect people. Marriage is all about, I don't want to say tolerating because that's such a low level. It's all about compensating and complementing and connecting one with the other with our imperfections. That is the essence of marriage. So it says the Heligot of Nosen, the Talmud of Rav Nachman. It says Rav Nachman, what was the chait of Shnei Bnei Aaron? Vayamusu, why they die? Because they refused to get married. They stayed in the freezer. And why they refused to get married? Because they thought they were above marriage. There's no one worthy of me. I'm perfect. And all the women out there are imperfect. So how could I get married? First of all, you're not perfect. You're not perfect. The fact that you think you're perfect is your greatest imperfection. Evidence of your imperfection. The more perfect you think you are, the more flawed you are. So first of all, you're not perfect. But second of all, that is the essence of marriage. We grow, we become better. We improve ourselves when we're married and connect and complement with imperfections of others and they with our imperfections. So that's the connection between that they were makter, the skitoris, but they didn't understand the chalbana. So how could they be the kohen gadol? How could they inherit their father's place? How could they ever serve when they need to feel room and space for the imperfect, for the chalbana? What a teaching of Rav Nachman. Megid Yosef. Megid Yosef has been guest to our community several times. I'll share with you. Yosef Yehuda Leib Saratskin. Writes, Acharei Moshe Nei Bnei Aaron. He tells another reason. Chazal give us. The Medrash of Ayikar Raba. Chaf Ches. Writes the following. Bishvil Dal Dvorah Mesu Banashal Aaron. For four reasons. The sons of Aaron died. One of the reasons is they did not solicit advice one from the other. Wow, it's a capital crime now. When you act in life without getting advice, when you go at it on your own without seeking advice or guidance from others, now a capital crime. Our own sons died. They were struck down. Why? They didn't consult. They didn't get advice. Psikta, the Medrash, adds, Ish, Me'atzmo Asa. Everyone came to their own conclusion. They came to their own, their own conclusion. The great Nobel Prize winner, Professor Kahneman, Daniel Kahneman, was asked if there was one word in the one thing in the world he could change, what would it be that would make the world a better place? You know what his answer was? Overconfidence. Overconfidence. World wars, famines crashing economies, people killing each other, all resulted from overconfidence. It's a fascinating answer. Overconfidence. Says the Medrash, the sons of Aaron, Adav and Avio had, they, they died from a classic case of overconfidence. They didn't consult one another. They each acted confidently on their own. Tamuam Adavram, Frek de Megid Yosef, he asks, Kevin Shishnema Yubadei Acha Shekach Yesh Lasos, what do you mean? They were aligned. They were partners. They came to the same conclusion. They were chavrusas, brothers. They said, let's bring this sacrifice together. So what did they do wrong? They needed to consult one another. They did better. They came to the conclusion together. How would it have happened? What do you think? What do you think? What do you mean, what do I think? What do I think? We're about to do this together. Isn't it clear what I think? 
So how could the Medjur say that's what they were held accountable for when they were overconfident and they did it on their own and they failed to consult? What do you mean? They did it together. Listen to what he says. Says of Saratska, Nira Lavar betray Anpe. You could answer, you could understand this in one of two ways. I think it's a tremendous insight. You know what happens in life sometimes? We're all gung ho, we're geared up. You get excited and passionate about something. You're going to start a new project, you're going to start a new business. You fall in love really in lust or longing at the very beginning of a relationship without really thinking it through, without realize, without really absorbing or analyzing, without really evaluating. So what happens? It wears off. And then what's left? What do you have? How many people come out of the gate with a business idea they thought was a great idea, a project they thought was a great idea, but they didn't go strategically and methodically and slowly. They didn't get guidance and speak to others. His lavos, there's a passion, there's a fire. But you know what happens sometimes when there's a fire and a passion? It blinds you, it creates blind spots. You come out of the gate with an incredible business idea, so overconfident and arrogant, you don't run it by anybody, you don't get expert advice, you don't study the market, you don't understand your competition, you come out of the gate with incredible idea, passion, fire, full steam ahead, you sink your life savings in. And then you know what happens? just a little bit into the new business, something sinks your ship that you would have seen coming if you'd only asked somebody. If only you had consulted. If only you had gotten advice. So number one is, you're right, they were on the same page. But what if they had stopped and said to one another, you know what? Talk to me like you're not doing it with me. What do you think of this? Have we thought it through entirely? Is it entirely a good idea? Number two, kolacha pola pishikol daito. Because they were going to do it together, each was excited to do it, which meant they were biased about it because they were already invested in doing it themselves. But if they'd give advice one to the other from a position not of I'm your partner doing it with you, but talk to me like you're an outsider who's not invested in doing it. Have we missed an angle? Have we thought it entirely through? Is this entirely a great idea? As There's a reason. He doesn't quote this. The Mishnah Novos teaches, Mar be'etza, mar betfuna. Says the Mishnah Novos, mar be'etza. Seek a lot of advice. If you turn a lot for advice, you'll gain a lot of wisdom. The smartest, most successful, are not the people who go at it alone, who have an overconfidence and an arrogance. But they're the people who have the modesty and humility to get advice from everyone. You learn so much from other people's mistakes rather than your own. So Chazal say, one of their causes of death, one of the reasons that's offered, is they didn't get advice one from the other. Overconfidence. And overconfidence can be a killer. Okay, moving right along. Speak to your brother. I said we've spoken about this in the past. The great Rechaim Shvalevet, familiarity breeds contempt. You can't come in whenever you want. Ki be'anan ira'e ala kaporos. Ayavo b'choles. Says Rabbi Chezkel Abramsky. Ayavo b'choles. This special tzivoy that came to the Kohen Gadol. He can't enter the Kodesh HaGadosh whenever he wants, or else he'll drop dead. However, on Yom Kippur he comes in. And why does he go in on Yom Kippur? What is he removing? What did he bring into the Kodesh HaGadoshim? He brought in a shovel. The ingredients of the incense we just spoke about were left, they burned, and then he went to retrieve the empty shovel. Tzarech Lahavin asked Rabbi Yechezkel Abramsky, the great, great Chazan Yechezkel, Mahaisa Achashivas Hagadola, Lahotzi Yamisham, Ad Kedei Livshot is Big Day Azov, Lubosh Big Day Love, and Likanes Bamiyuchad. Kohen Gadol is wearing his gold investments, changes, wardrobe change, wardrobe change takes off the gold investments and puts on the white ones. All for what reason? To go get out the empty shovel. He's never allowed to go in the whole rest of the year. He's not allowed to go in casually for no reason. And yet, this is so significant, it's worth going in, and it's worth changing into other clothing. Wardrobe change. 
Why not leave it there till the next year? When you bring the next shovel in the next year, you'll bring out the empty one. What was so important or significant that it was worth going in for a space that he was never allowed to go in? It's a great question. Listen to the answer. It says Rabbi Chesk Abramsky, Marakan Yisod Gadol, B'makom Kadosh, Ein Makom Lekelem Rekim. In a holy place, there's no room for empty vessels. Ke Kedusha V'Rekanos Heim Shnei Hafachim. Holiness and emptiness are two opposites. Lachein Otsas Hakelem Mikta B'Kodosh HaKadoshim, Yavoda Koch Hashuva Atsheroi Likanos B'Miyuchad Avura. What is holiness? What is holiness? Holiness is realizing that there's meaning and purpose and sanctity that fills every space. Holiness permeates. Holiness spreads. It promulgates. Holiness is seeing the hand of Hashem and the opportunity to come close to Hashem and the sanctity and the significance that fills everything. So in the holiest place, there can't be emptiness. Where there's holiness, which is fullness, there can't be emptiness. And therefore, so incongruous and so inconsistent was having something empty in a holy place that it was worthy of going in to get something empty and bring it out. You're not nearly as excited about this thought as I am. Maybe the matzah is still sitting in your stomach. I don't know what it is. You're still, you're still waking up. But it's a beautiful thought. It's a very deep thought. Holiness is fullness. And therefore, emptiness, they can't go together. Okay, we'll move on. Apostle Gimel. So you can't go in whenever you want. How can you go in? What is the prerequisite? What is the key? What is the cost? Bezos yavo aron ala kodesh. Simple understanding is what's the bezos? With this, Aaron can come in. A young bull, he's got to bring a chatas, a ram for a carbon ola. What's the bezos? You know, we say mamon, som, the gematria. We've spoken about that in the past. What is the bezos? What is the with this he can go in? Says Rashi, Avzu, lobuchol es, can be a makipurim. Even the bezos, with this he can go in, we're not talking about whenever he wants. The bezos, that which allows and gives license for him to go in, is still not casually whenever he wants. It's only on Yom Kippur. The Medrash Rabbah expands. Before we get to the Medrash Rabbah, bezos. Bezos, how does it know it? This is what the Medrash says, I'm sorry. Rashi says it has to be on Yom Kippur. Bezos, says the Medrash, bezchus ha-Torah. With what merit does he enter the Holy Holies? In the merit of Torah. How do you know that? Can you think of another phrase that is the word zos? I'll give you a hint. Hagba. Zos Torah. Zos Torah Shesam Moshe. Says the Medrash, Bezos Yavo Aaron. What's the Bezos? What gives him the strength? What gives him the credibility? What gives him the credit? Why is he allowed to enter? Bezos. Zos Torah. In the merit the Torah he's learned, and the merit of the Torah he represents, Bezos HaTorah, Bezos Yavo. Writes the Nitziv on this, writes the Nitziv, in his Hamek Davar, says the Nitziv, HaKasav Modiyenu Shabiyyam HaKippurim Uyom Melcham Al Yisrael Nsari Mala Shemakatrigim Harbe Al Yisrael. This is a war. Yom Kippur, there's a fight, there's a battle, there's a war. The adversaries, the enemies, the alter egos, the prosecutors of the Jewish people are fighting in heaven about our unworthiness. David we say in the David, im takum alay milchama, what do we say? Bezos ani boteach. Im takum alay milchama. And they come against me in a war. When our enemies stand up against us to battle, be they physical enemies, Hamas, Hezbollah, Iran, anti-Semites, v'hisha amda b'cholder v'ador amda malin l'chal whoever they are in our generation, when they stand up against us, or they're the prosecuting angels who are trying to convince the heavenly court of our unworthiness. How do we get through? How do we break through? With what merit? What's the bezos aniboteach? Makavana Torah. The Nitziv says, Pilpula shal Torah. Hodienu akasav kanshi bezchus pilpula shal Torah. Hucharvam shal Yisrael. What is our weapon? Torah. In the merit of learning Torah, in the merit of living Torah, in the, memory, in the merit of protecting 
the Torah values and Torah definitions and Torah principles and Torah way of life. Bezos, ani boteach. In takum alai milchama, they rise against me in war. Bezos, ani boteach. What's the zos? In this, I trust the merit of Torah. What's the bezos yavo? With what merit does Aaron go in? In the merit of Torah. Zos ha Torah. What is zos? Zos ha Torah. And that's when you see the word zos. Whenever you see the word zos, bezos yavo Aaron, bezos ani boteach. The word zos means zos is Torah. And how do you know that? Because of zos ha Torah. Okay, moving along. Turn the page. Uah. Try not to get carpal tunnel. Tezayin, Tezayin. Turn a couple pages. Don't hurt yourself. Page 640, the Art Scroll Stone Chumash. Made our way through the opening. I'll say one more word about the opening. Only because tomorrow night's Yom HaShoah. We have our animal, annual Yom HaShoah program. And frankly, it's a scary time. I, uh, I officiated a funeral Sunday of a woman who was a survivor. The mother of one of our members. She was a survivor. And I said in opening the funeral, I turned to the family for whom, of course, this is the most acutely painful loss. They feel it the most personally. But make no mistake, in our time, the loss of every survivor is not just a loss for that family. It is an enormous loss for our people. We're losing a generation. We're losing an era of heroes, of an unimaginable resilience and faith and fortitude who were role models that maybe we failed to appreciate enough in their lifetime, among our greatest heroes in history, we're losing that generation. Yom HaShoah used to be packed with survivors from that day meant so much. And we honored the memory of who they lost, and we honored and celebrated the lives and the rebuilding they did. We're losing it. It's tragic. It's painful. Anyway, I said at her funeral, Acharemos Shnei Bnei Aaron. The whole name of this parsha is, what did Aaron do? And that's what we're going to get to now. He lost two sons, inexplicably, unimaginably, prematurely, tragically. Was he debilitated? Did he stop? Did he, re- did he become a hermit? Aaron mourned, he grieved, no doubt. No doubt there was a hole in his heart that was never filled. But he was strong, faithful, and resilient. And he was committed to a continuity of this mission. And he carried himself with a joy for life. And he found the ability. And that's the name of the Pasha, Acharemos. There is an Acharemos. So the way I eulogized that woman was to say there's an Acharemos. She lived her life with an Acharemos. She built a beautiful family. And she was committed to a Jewish continuity. And that's true for survivors. Acharemos, after what they lost. We get that from Avram Avinu. It says when he lost Sarah, who was not only his other half, he was, she was his whole. Avram lives another, I think, 37 or 38 years after he loses Sarah, and we don't hear one word from him. The Av Hamon Goyim, the father of ethical monotheism, the creator of all nations, he's done. When Sarah's gone, he's done. He's nothing without her, literally. What does he do after he buries her? Vayakam me'al p'nei meso. Vayakam. The Jewish way is we get up from Shiva. That's what we say. We get up from Shiva. That's the Jewish way. We get up from Shiva. Tomorrow night we'll have the privilege of hosting two survivors who were only reunited recently after 70 years. You might have read about them. They've been in the news. They're going to be our guests and tell their story and be united together on this bima. And I hope everybody will show up to honor them and honor those who are no longer here and continue to to recognize what this means in our lives and how we can learn from them. So, Acharemos, that was just the other last word I wanted to say on Acharemos. Page 640. The incense service, the Ketores. We provide atonement for the sanctuary for the contamination of the Jewish people. And so shall you do for the tent of meeting that dwells with them in their contamination. What does it mean, v'chein ya'aseh? V'chein ya'aseh la'o mo'ed. Hashochein yitam b'soktu mo'som. What does that mean? Says Rashi. Afa pishem tmeim shechina b'neihem. Even though they are impure, the shechina 
dwells and is among them. The sin, the chait, that you're bringing the bull and the goat, is Tumas Mikdash Ukdashav. That means, what's the case? Someone entered the Beis Mikdash when they were in a state of impurity, or they were pure, but they ate something which is impure. That's what we're talking about over here. Afa Pishem Tmeim, Shechina Beinehem. Even when one is impure, says Rashi, Hashem is still among them. The Zohar HaKadosh writes, even when you sin, when you're low, the Shekhinah is still among you. And it comes cloaked, it presents itself, the Shekhinah, the presence of Hashem. How? In the form of the feminine, Ima. Ima. This is a teaching of our mystical great work, the Zohar. Why an Ima? Why a mother? If we generally talk about God, God, of course, does not have a gender. God is not Jewish flender. God is not God is not gender fluid. He doesn't have a gender. Never had, never will have. He's above a gender. He's outside a gender. He's God. We don't know what that means or what that looks like because we can't relate. But God is God. And yet we anthropomorphize God. We attribute attributes to God so that we can better connect or relate to him and we normally think of God as a man, the masculine. We talk about God, Allah and Zohar, as a he. But says the Zohar here in this teaching, God here presents as a woman, as an ima. That even when we are contaminated and impure, even when we are failed and we're low, the Shekhinah God is still accessible and available to us. And when he is, then he's in his feminine form. Why? What does that mean? Says of Chaim Velazhenor, Says the Heiliger Chaim Velazhener, Aveim Shlem Oavim Estinukam. Both the father and mother love their children. They hug, they kiss, they play, they get nachas from their children. But when that child wakes up in the middle of the night with a fever, when the child has soiled their diaper, and the child needs to employ the patience and the selfless dedication, Haim no telos oso mitapelos bo. When a father says, Mayday, Mayday, I can't change this diaper. Who's he calling Mayday for? The mother comes in and rescues the moment. There's nothing when it comes to her child that's too nasty or gross or disgusting. There's nothing that she won't engage in for the good of her child. When we're soiled and dirty and disgusting and nasty, the Shechina presents like a mother and comes down and says, I'm not too afraid to change you. I'm not too afraid to be with you. I'm not too afraid to protect you. I'm not too afraid. You have a stomach virus. You have thrown up the entire night. This is the 15th time. I'll be there for the 16th time too. The father long ago ran away, couldn't take it. He threw up three times just because he saw or smelled or heard about the throw up. I know I'm making stereotypes. I got it. Save the email. I got it. These are stereotypes. For the most part, probably true. So the Zohar says, when God is showing up, even when we are throwing up and need our diaper changed, when we're nasty and disgusting and repulsive, when God nevertheless never fails to show up because of that selfless devotion and dedication, then God takes that form of a mother, the feminine form, the loving feminine form of the mother. He wants to change us and clean us up and make us cute and adorable and beautiful once again and smell nice. To free us and liberate us from that nasty stench that is the Yitzhahara that surrounds us. That's Rav Chaim. Okay. Now we move over. Skip a couple more pages. We concluded the Torah service, and we move over to the commandment of holiest day of the year, Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. Perak Tes Zayin Pasuk Lamed. I will spare you singing it. Lifne Hashem Titaru. We say this pasuk over and over and over again on Yom Kippur. Kiva Yom Azeh, on this day, Yechaper Aleichem, Letaher Eschem, 
on this day, Shem provides atonement to purify us. From all of our mistakes, Lefnei Hashem Titaru. Says the Heilige Kotzker, the Holy Kotzker in this Emes Ve'emuna, Emes, ki hi yom kippur mechaper. Emes, ki bi yom azeh yechaper. It's true. On this day you achieve atonement. Aval du'u lachem, ki alechem latar eschem, ve'atzmechem, mikol chatosechem. The day has an incredible ability. Itzumo shayom mechaper. Gemara teaches, Rabbi Kiva teaches, the day itself atones. It is a national clemency day. Every now and then you hear, they announce, everyone who has an illegal gun, if you turn it in today, a great a national clemency and pardon. No one's asking, no one's following up, just turn it in. Imagine a national clemency day. Everyone who's delinquent and owes taxes, everyone who's falling behind and never filed, this year we're wiping the slate clean. Everybody fresh start. National day of clemency. So it's true, HaKadosh Baruch who created Yom Kippur as the Yitzu Moshe Yom. It's true that Yom Kippur is a day of national collective clemency, clean slate for everybody. The day itself, as long as you arrive at the day on the calendar, you tap into that clemency. However, says the Kotzker, when is that? When is it Biyam HaZeichaper? Only when? Aleichem Atayr Eschem Be'atzmechem Mikol Chatoseichem. We have to first come in with an attitude that we are muchanim umuzharam litar. We're ready. The day can do the work when we have the want. We have to want to start again. We have to want to start anew. Kadosh Baruch will meet us more than halfway. Kadosh Baruch will make it easy. Kadosh Baruch will make it accessible. Kadosh Baruch will accelerate our success. But we have to want. That is the prerequisite. We have to want to start to begin. Perak Yitzayin, Pasuk Dal. We move over Yom Kippur. Al Pasach HaOmoyed lo evil la'akriv korban l'ashem dim eshkan Hashem. Dam yechashev lo'ish ahu, dam shafach. Benechras ha'nefesh ahi, ahu, sorry, mikarev amo. Pasuk Dal. Torah tells us, and he has not brought it to the entrance of the tent of meaning to bring it as an offering to Hashem before the tabernacle, shall be considered bloodshed. He shed blood, and that person, nechrasa, that person is cut off. What are we talking about? We're talking about a person is not permitted to kill an animal, a consecrated animal outside of the Mishkan. The act of slaughter reverts back to its statutes before Noah. Slaughtering an animal is a tantamount to bloodshed. The death penalty is only when you take a human life. So what's going on over here? What's happening in this Pasuk? So Rashi says, Dam ye chashev. Dam ye chashev. What's going on? Says Rashi, Kishofech dam ha'adam shemeschayev benafsho. Shofech dam ha'adam shemeschayev benafsho. It's like you killed somebody who was liable with their life. Rav Gedalia Eisenman, who was the mashkiach of Kol Torah, says, Tafkir ha'korbanos l'romen mes ha'adam ula ha'alosa l'korv ha'lakosh baruchu. The goal and the role of the sacrifices is to elevate us and to bring us and draw us close to Hashem. Kamuvan, sheito biyachad umalam makarvis kol olam achashuch l'shor shay elyon. So when the human being is elevated, we elevate and we bring the whole world with us. When we are worthy and when we are elevated and when we're living our best selves, then we elevate the whole world. Adam shemakriv korban b'chutz, but a person who has shchute chutz, if you sacrifice a consecrated animal that was designated for the mikdash, but you casually make a barbecue with it in your backyard, you violated the essence and the goal, which was to elevate the world to God. So that's the essence, that's the goal. In other words, who did you kill? Pasuk says, It's like murder. Rashi says, You murdered somebody who was guilty of death. Who did you murder? Says Rigadaya Eisenman, you murdered yourself. You were meant to elevate this world. The best version of you elevates this world. You're meant to transform yourself. And when we fail to meet our potential, there's the potential us within ourselves. And when we fail to live and meet our potential, when we don't live our best selves, we've committed an act of murder. Who's the victim? Whom did we murder? 
our potential selves. We murdered the best version of ourselves. You can kill time and you can kill potential and you can kill creativity and you can kill certain skills and assets that we have. When we waste and we squander, when we don't take advantage, or when we use them for the wrong purposes, what the Torah calls shchutechutz, when you sacrifice something consecrated and holy and you do it in a mundane way, you've killed. Who did you kill yourself? So we have consecrated parts of ourselves. We have holy parts of ourselves. We have pieces and parts of ourselves that are meant to do holy things. And when we don't, we misdirect them and we use them in mundane ways. We've killed a piece and a part of ourselves. Any person among you may not consume blood. Everyone who lives among you, you're not allowed to eat blood. Torah here cautions us. Biblical prohibition. We know we're not allowed to eat blood. Not allowed to eat blood. Kol nefesh mikem lo sochal dam. Lo sochal dam. Zog tadashi. Kol nefesh mikem. Any soul among you. Why not just say lo sochal dam? You can't eat blood. Did we think there were souls among us who could eat blood? Why does the Torah have to say this? What seems to be extraneous language. Kol nefesh mikem. Zog tadashi. La hazir gedolim ala katanim. Adults need to be vigilant. Work hard. When your child is begging, please, can I have some blood? Please, can I drink more blood? Please, I want blood. Adults, parents need to be vigilant. No more blood for you. You've had enough blood. You're not allowed to have blood. Blood is prohibited. You can't eat any. Now you're looking at me like I'm crazy, which is exactly what the Megid Yosef asks. Ask to have are your kids clamoring for blood? This is where the Torah needs to go out of its way to tell us. This is where the Torah has to tell us. Be careful. Be vigilant. It's not candy. It's blood. More than other pro- prohibitions. Where else do we see Lahazah Gedola Malakatanim? One other place in the Torah. Where? Kohanim are warned what? Be vigilant that the children can't become contaminated, just like you have to protect and preserve yourself and your purity. Don't become impure. Protect and preserve the children. And right there, Rav Sarotskin's grandfather, the Megid Yosef's grandfather, in his Naim Torah writes, <speaking> In Yitumas Kaonim, Hasiva Yisrael, Sayyidim Yisrael Bizeh, Lachain, Avodas Abaz, Lachanach is Banav. Why? Why do the adult Kohanim need to be vigilant? that their little Kohanim children are not contaminated. Why that mitzvah more than others? The answer of Sarotskin, his grandfather writes, is because when it comes to other mitzvahs, we're all in it together. You put the child in a good environment, and everybody will do the right thing. But the little Kohen kids, the rest of their environment are not warned about this. The rest of their environment don't have to worry about this. So the little Kohen kids, the parents need to be vigilant because their peers are not going to support their vigilance because the coin stands out. Their peers are allowed to become contaminated. Says the grandson, the Megad Yosef, Arav Saratskin, the same is true when it comes to eating blood. When it comes to all the other foods, we can say, it's disgusting. We don't eat that. Don't go near that. We don't value that. We don't care about that. But blood is different. There's more nuance when it comes to blood. Listen to this interpretation. Why is there more nuance when it comes to blood? There is no mitzvah when it comes to the pig or pork or bacon. So we can say, we're yidden. We don't eat pig and pork and bacon. Move on. Disgusting. Should be repulsive to us. We're not interested. But the father can't say that about blood. Why? Blood has mitzvahs. Can you name a mitzvah with blood? A bris, you have to expose the blood, but with an animal. What's a mitzvah with blood with an animal? Kisay adam. It's a mitzvah to cover the blood. It's a mitzvah of kisay adam. After you shecht and the blood spills, we cover it. Mitzvah of kisay adam. What's another mitzvah with blood? It's one of the four parts of the avoda. The mikdash, zrika adam. You slaughter the sacrifice, and then zrika adam. You have to sprinkle the blood on the altar. So you see... Not only does blood have a role and a place, we're not supposed to be repulsed by, repulsed by blood. 
Where do you see that? Oh, I had so many more things to say. Where do you see that? We're just same as normal before Pesach. Where do you see that? Gemar Pesachim tells a story, Daphne Zayin. There was a Kohen who served in the Mikdash with gloves. Why? Because he thought blood was disgusting. He wore gloves. He thought it was disgusting. So the Gemara says, we threw him out of the base of Mikdash. Tzemikan, u'mechabiris atzmo, u'mechalo kodshe shemayim. You're so worried about touching a little blood. You know what you're doing. You're you're so worried more about yourself than honoring Hashem. He was thrown out for wearing gloves. We wear gloves. Mo'alim should wear gloves. I'm not knocking wearing gloves. But that's the story in the Mesa Mikdash. So it says Rav Saratskin, you see, you know why Mozar Gedola Malakitanim? Listen to this teaching. This is another partial perspective for today. You know what we don't have today in our generation? You know what we don't have? Nuance. Nuance. We live in a perfect world of all or nothing, of binary, this or that, with me or against me, love it or hate it. Torah says, you know what there is about blood? It's a little something called nuance. On the one hand, we do the mitzvahs, kisei adam, and zrika. It has a value and a role and a place, and don't be repulsed by it. On the other hand, you're not allowed to eat it. So how do you communicate and teach that nuance? Lahazir gedola malakatanim. The more something demands nuance, the more it takes maturity and sophistication of adults to be vigilant in teaching it to children. Anything that takes nuance takes more vigilance. We've lost that art of nuance today. It's so important to bring it back. Okay, I only had about 20 more things to tell you. Such good stuff. Good stuff. Shmartem is chukosai. Molech. Shmartem is mishmarti. But we'll pick up with it again next year. Meanwhile, tomorrow we'll pick up 8.15 with 10 minutes of meeting with Silas Hashar, 8.45 living with Amuna. Tomorrow night behind the Bima is the interview that we'll do at 7 p.m. at the Yom HaShoah program with these two wonderful survivors. Till next time, stay happy, stay healthy, stay holy.